Aloha. Uh, this is uh, Politics for the People. And uh, we are uh, welcoming you to this Think Tech show, which occurs every week. I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and I'm your host for the show. Our topic today is about sanctions and san the sanctions dilemma. How why, when to end, and those kinds of topics. Our panel of guests is here to discuss these uh, issues with us. And I'd like to welcome Jay Fidel and Tim Apicella. So welcome. What, uh, well, let's just get started, Jay, on the sanctions dilemma. You know, what, what, what is the efficacy of the sanctions today? Let's start with where we are and what they are and how they're working. What what, do you, what are you thinking about that? Well, it's, it's mechanical. You, you put the sanctions in place to discourage Russia from invading Ukraine. Okay, and Russia continues to evade the sanctions and invade Ukraine. So I guess I would have to say they can't be working. If they're working, it's in some future sense. If they're working, it's in some sense that reaches, um, you know, the, the people on the street some way. But it, it hasn't stopped Putin from attacking Ukraine, period. It That's has brought. He, he's still doing it. Yeah, he has. He, he, we've brought it's brought suffering to the people and and uh, no has had no impact on Putin is what you're saying. So no, he gets around it. He finds ways to get around it. I mean, his. His trick a few days ago was to sell oil for ruples, um, and that and that bolstered the price, the value of a ruple. So where the ruple initially came way down because of the sanctions, uh, that brought it up again. And so uh, he's got you know he's got things up his sleeve. He's able to maintain the war even though uh, you know. Uh, even though he's got the sanctions on him. Now, one other trick he's doing, I, I'm sure there are a lot of tricks, you know, on his playbook, um, is that, you know, there, remember there are two pipelines uh, to Germany. One is called number one, and one is called number two. And um, number two, they, they pulled the permit on it. The Germans said, we're not going to finish that, and we're not going to take um, oil through that pipeline. Okay, great. But nobody talks about number one. And uh, in fact, um, you know, number one is still pumping. And in fact, he's earning hundreds of millions of, of euros every day from the sale of oil through number one. Um, and that's helping him fund the war over a period of time. That is a lot of money. So uh, let's see the number. Oh, it's Nord Stream. Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 isn't functioning, but Nord Stream 1 still is. And he's got other things up his sleeve, too. And he manages to deflect uh, the effects um, of the sanctions so far. Well, Tim, can you continue on this issue um, as to whether there can be an effect? Can the West have an effect on Putin that's damaging and, and will deter him? What do you think about that? What is it that can be done and can it be done? Well, it's, you know, the coalition has to hold hands and decide to do these very difficult things together. And the thing that will finally make Putin pause for a moment, maybe reverse, uh, reverse the invasion, uh, if Europe, all of Europe says, no, we're not going to buy your oil or your gas products. Uh, but that's not happening, as Jay just pointed out. And as long as that's still occurring, then Putin gets the, the funding for his, his incursion, his invasion. So that would be the next step, I think. If, if already um, Putin is a war criminal, but it hasn't been formally defined. Uh, by the way, once you have a definition of war criminal, it makes it changes the playing field altogether. Um, once that definition has been labeled on Putin, and I don't think it's if it's just when, um, you you will see the rest of Europe being forced not to play ball with him because of that definition. So until that definition is uh, is developed and and sticks to him, uh, it, it could go either way. It really could. These sanctions. 
Okay, so so Tim, do you think that the the Europe needs um, a lot of encouragement to do this? Um, they are the frontier. You no, know, they need gas and they need oil, and they need it from the United States. We've got to pump up production, which you know. Um, some of the criticisms for Biden shutting things down immediately, um, some of that could be valid. Some of those criticisms, I'm sure he didn't, incur, you know, anticipate an incursion from Russia into Ukraine like like we all have seen. And so it's going to take time to um, revive either fracking or or some of the gas production and get it over to Germany and Europe. But until they can have a replacement, you can't just shut the lights off in Europe and say, sorry, you're not having any heat in your house and you're not going to have any lights. So that's not workable. So there has to be an alternative source until we can finally squeeze the, uh, Russia out of the game. All right. And we have the technology to go forward with it. So that's a wonder. That's an appropriate suggestion and highly needed. What about um, the Europeans who have led uh, the the have led the, the world in understanding the the threat that that this uh, that Putin and his um and and his country hold towards towards Europe and the West. Um, are, are they in in position, and do they are they willing to make more sacrifice? I know you say that they would have to do that. I mean, the question is, if if we're going to have stronger sanctions to get at the oil and gas. Uh, Russia part of it, but um, do they, are they going to be willing to make that kind of sacrifice? Do you see, Tim, that they have that? Um, you know, again, I think the more draconian Putin portrays himself and acts, the easier it's for Europe to do that. And again, well, I think once the definition of war criminal and war crimes is levied against Putin in Russia, it makes it easier for them to say, okay, we really have to cross the Rubicon here. We're going to have to incur some pain. But if not here now, then it'll be later. So we, we already have a mad dog for um, as a participant in Europe. His name is Putin. And like all mad dogs, they need to be put down. It's just getting to that point where they realize that uh, this guy cannot play on the world stage ever again. And again, once the definition is levied, then that makes that decision a lot easier. And therefore, they can go to the, the you know, the people of, of each country and say, mm -hmm. we really are in a pre-World War II environment here where we have a madman and we have to put him down. And we're going to have to take him out economically first, and then hopefully he'll be captured and taken to The Hague later. But that's way down the road. So um, the economic pain needs to be endured first. But I think... He's already crossed that line and certainly would cross the line even further with uh, the uh, advancement of chemical or biological weapons. That's a, that's a very important point. And so, Jay, do you think that um, there's any possibility that the Russian people are ready to change that leadership? And, and where do you think the impetus comes for changing the leadership? I think I'm making an assumption that it's the people, but do you agree with that? How, how might that work and how likely is that? That's certainly in, uh, um, in the near, near term. It's not likely at all. This is out of 1984 and George Orwell, he's got them all brainwashed. He's uh, flooding the propaganda, uh, and a good percentage of them are buying it, uh, have, have already integrated it. Sort of like the, the Trump base, you know, it's not rational, it's not critical thinking, but they buy it because it's all over them every day in television. So, um, A, I, I don't think the Russian people are ready, you know, to depose him. Um, and B, I don't think that's likely going to happen in the future either. Um, this is an example of what a dictator can do using the technology of the media. And as is a sad story is he'll continue in office and it'll, it'll take some really remarkable events to take him out of office. Maybe a select few that would do a, a putsch um, or a coup, um, but I don't see any indication of that either. I mean, you know what, what would happen to you if you did that. He's managed to squash the press. He's managed to squash uh, opponents in any election, uh, freedom of speech, and democracy in general. I mean, there were, there were figments of it a couple of years ago. Navalny was a figment of it. 
but now it's over and he controls the country and everybody seems to be, you know, buying into that. So that's the way it is and that's the way it's going to be. And if you're looking for a path to remove him, I, I really, I don't think anyone can see the path. But let me go back to, um, you know, the designation of this man as a war criminal. Uh, I'm not sure that that can happen in absentia. <clears throat> you know, it's a sequence thing. Uh, if, if you, uh, I guess if you start a proceeding, which I think they are starting a proceeding, you're saying, you know, there's some evidence for the proposition that he's a war criminal, therefore we'll have a proceeding, but then you got to get him and then you got to litigate it and you got to show that he fits within whatever the definition is. Um, I think that um, the people of Europe, I'm not sure about the US, but the people of Europe have already decided, I mean, the, the thoughtful people of Europe, because there's, there's a lot of people who'd rather go to a soccer game, you know, all over Europe, just like here, we'd rather go to a volleyball game. Um, but uh, the thoughtful people of Europe have already concluded, uh, including NATO and the EU officials, They've already concluded he's a war criminal, um, and it does uh, shape their thinking. It was a, there was a, some comments between the foreign minister of Ukraine um, and the NATO chief of the NATO uh, organization yesterday, and somebody said, uh, your attitude about weapons uh, seems to have changed, NATO. Uh, what made it change? And he said very flat out, Buka made it change. Um, the war crimes that were conducted in Bucha have made us change our view on what weapons we're going to give the Ukrainians, and we will give them more. And of course, the guy from Ukraine, the foreign minister, was saying, there's only three things uh, in my agenda. So what's that? That's weapons, weapons, and weapons. <laughs> and what is that? Yeah, it was a sense good. of humor, like, like Zelensky. Yeah, um, yeah, but, yeah. But the point is that they're on the same page now about weapons anyway, because the Ukrainians probably want more <laughs> and, and more powerful and more high tech and all that. But they're, they're getting, or at least they're getting promises now, immediate promises from yeah. NATO about giving them more weapons. And it's all because of what uh, Putin has done in Bucha and other cities like Mariupol. I mean, he's killed thousands of people. Uh, is there, you know, and Tim and I have had this conversation before, uh, what exactly is the difference when you just kill everybody in sight systematically with high tech? What's, you know, and you don't even take care of them. You don't allow them humanitarian. I mean, th that is war crimes. That is tantamount to what happened in Germany. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll keep on going until somebody stops Putin. It'll go from 5,000 to 10,000 to 50,000 into the millions unless somebody stops him. Well, you know, the topic of the show is the dilemma of sanctions, which um, was meant to point to the potential success of sanctions in that if you impose sanctions, you have um, a, a withdrawal date in mind and, and you have circumstances upon which that withdrawal would be made. And it looks like perhaps you're saying that Putin has already outplayed that one because there's not gonna be any with, there's not gonna be any response that, that's gonna lighten or withdraw this war from, from, from the people of Ukraine. Tim, what do you think about that? Has he, has he really- Well, sanctions, done that? again, I go back to my point, once the definition of war criminal has been labeled, there is no withdrawal of sanctions until, until this war criminal is apprehended, I think. Um, just as a point, you know, remember the Serb leader, uh, Milosevic, was convicted in absentia. He was convicted, and uh, then they got him. And then he served his time out and died at The Hague. So it can be done. He doesn't have to be captured first, then put on trial. It could all be done in absentia. So, um, but again, one of the things that uh, uh, Putin wants that he mentioned in Turkey was that uh, one, that you drop the quest for NATO, two, you drop the sanctions, and three, you drop all, uh, all uh, allegations of, of war crimes. I think we're past that now. I don't think in negotiations you can go to that and give Putin what he wants. So therefore, how do you negotiate a settlement of the Ukraine invasion when war crimes will be on the table and won't be taken off the table? Mm -hmm. So how do you get to diplomacy again? So that's where we're far, far from that. 
even though Putin has acted. Had, had we not seen Bucha, yeah. had we not seen it, you know, up front and close, um, Putin might have had an opportunity to get out of it. But now it's etched in our memories. And it's, and Jay yesterday said, and, and rightly so, how is this any different than the camps of Auschwitz and all the death camps in Germany and Poland and uh, the, the Holocaust? How is this any different? And you really have to look at it and say, there isn't. Well, it's different in number, that's all. No, that's numbers, cool. yes, of course, yes. And you, you rightly pointed out that uh, the Holocaust was focused on a, a particular race of people, and this one is this wholesale slaughter of everyone. Yeah. Yes, it's, it, it, it's dire. Um, uh, we do have. I want to. I want to go to one point, though. Okay, we you have know, a question. This, after that, one second, you framed this around the word dilemma. Okay, and and and, and I take uh, Tim's point about dilemma. First of all, we we have seen so far in the past several months, and then if you look back into 2013 and 2014, that that Putin doesn't doesn't make peace. He never makes peace. He, he, he goes to the end game all the time, um, and he hasn't shown any sign of making peace now. Um, so it's, it's a theoretical thing only about whether he would um, get, get on the table and make peace. And he'd be so stressed that he would have to make peace. Uh, and then the question then, this is a dilemma. The question then is, is whether Zelensky would accept uh, any kind of peace agreement with Putin, even if there was a peace agreement, which I doubt, um, where, where Zelensky and Western Europe would forgive him the war crimes and would you know, reverse the sanctions. And Zelensky, rightly so, would say, no way. We are not forgiving him. We lost thousands of people. He destroyed our country. We're not forgiving him. Uh, Western Europe may be of a different mind about that. They might really want to have peace. And on the sanctions, I, I, although I think um, you know, Western Europe would probably roll the sanctions back as part of a peace right now, you know, end of sanctions, Zelensky would probably do that too. Mm -hmm. So it's the war crimes that create the dilemma. Um, it's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's resolvable. I don't think there's a, any middle ground. I don't think that's good. I, th I agree, it's gonna stand in the way of any negotiation because Zelensky will never agree to forgive. And of course, the question is- whether And nor Putin, should NATO. But Putin is always going to require those two points. Right. You have to forgive me, you have to pardon me and my country. And also you, you have to roll back the sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know about NATO. I mean, they're, they're gonna be practical at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and Jay, if if war criminal status uh, allows you to be taken out, um, in Putin's case, has he also bulwarked himself by by having all this disinformation and propaganda out there so that all of his people think he's doing a good thing in in uh, Ukraine? So uh, you're right. I mean, it's it's way? not it stands in the way for him. But remember that he doesn't settle. Um, and he doesn't settle. He, so you, know, it's, you know, the Russians have a famous thing about painting the grass green. When, when the general comes to the army barracks, they paint the grass green because it's a matter of delivering the message to the general and showing there. So he would probably, um, you know, announce that he won. He announced that he would announce that he won the war, even if he didn't win the war. That's, that'd be the Russian approach. Um, but I think more likely he's going to keep on pounding. He's going to keep on doubling down. Him and Trump do the same thing, keep mm -hmm. on doubling down. And at the end of the day, he's going to get into a position militarily where he can say he won, um, and whether he has to paint the grass green or not. And, and I think that's the, going to be the end of this. There isn't going to be an agreement. Mm -hmm. A uh, really important point. And I'm going to go to the question now so that we have a chance to cover it. And um, it's a little bit, it's long um, for, for as our questions usually go. So I'll read it, read it to you, and um, then we'll get some comment from Tim first. Okay. All right. Recently, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told Congress that the U.S. was prepared to use the same sorts of economic sanctions if China were to move against Taiwan, citing the success and severity of the sanctions against Russia. 
any approach to removing the sanctions against Russia will set a precedent for the duration and end state consequences of U.S. sanctions in similar cases of aggression like China versus Taiwan. In a sense, it clarifies and bounds the cost benefit analysis for future aggressor states, analysis which might show the cost to be worth the benefits. So should the U.S. consider the presidential value of its removal of sanctions, um, of its removal of sanctions on Russia in this way? And if so, what should that precedent be? So here we're taking it into the Hall of Mirrors another couple of feet. Um, I feel like I'm in a spelling bee. Could you use that in a sentence, please? Uh <laughs> So, okay. it's no, almost no, that's OK. You know, first off, um, Jersey Yellen, um, I find that odd that she made that comment because she's basically put President Biden in a corner um, about what's going to happen if uh, China gets involved with Taiwan. And I, I would think that's more of a political decision than the uh, Janet Yellen's decision. But that was interesting that she, she stated that. Um, we talked about this yesterday and, you know, what what sanctions do we start placing on China and India uh, for their support of Putin and his war machine, his invasion machine, and uh, they're helping him out on the side. Um, I think it's it is time for the world that buys products from China and India to say, maybe we won't. Maybe we cut that back and try to get some cooperation through a, a soft stick approach. And maybe the stick gets a little bit harder uh, if it fails to uh, garnish any results. So you would soften then the U.S. position. In other words, pull them, pull, give him, give him a chance to be in his own recovering economy. It yeah, seems like no, not for Putin. No, 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 no. Putin is. Again, he, he needs to be taken out one way or the other, either through his own people or other means. He's, he's crossed the Rubicon. He's gone too far. It's too late for Putin. He has to go. I agree with uh, President Biden. He needs to go. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying that you, this will take a lot longer if you keep getting countries like China and, and India to uh, help out on the side quietly. Well, they, they, may not, they may not continue to do that. I talked to somebody who just uh, came back from India um, and um, uh, the word is that the Indians are really softening on this. Good. Issue. That's good news to hear. That's Unfortunately, to hear it's hard tomorrow. for us to turn our backs on China because we get everything from China. That's yeah. tough. That's a tough order. It's hard for them to take a, an affirmative position, you know, supporting Russia, you know, yeah. affirmatively too, because you know we, they sell us everything. But I would like to. I would like to make a point that I don't remember we discussed yesterday, and that's this. Um, there's another there's another constituency here. It's the, the people who've been disrupted, tortured, maimed, killed, um, you know, who have had incredible suffering. And in, in, in the 21st century, in, I guess to me, in today's world, you should be entitled to some compensation for that, and certainly under American law and probably under European law. Now, there are enormous assets that are already frozen millions and millions and millions of dollars are frozen in the west so that even if you maybe it's a you know a, a sort of a gray answer here but even if you relax some of the sanctions for example you know you can buy oil from russia now it's okay um the fact is is all this money locked up and there are all these claims that are unresolved and okay? And, and I think those claims have to go forward and those assets that are locked up have to stand ready to pay those claims. So <clears throat> what is a life worth? What is torture worth? What is being maimed intentionally? What is uh, having your family thrown into a pit? What is that worth in, in ruples and in dollars or in, in whatever the funds they use in Ukraine? Yeah. Um, so my point is that um, a, a court has to get its hands on this. Mm -hmm. uh, a court has to determine how much these people should be compensated. And it is going to be a ton of money. And it well, is forever. 
Yeah, and the, rest, the, the reports I've heard lately are that the funds here that are in the United States under hidden names and uh, sequestered in various places, they're never leaving, they're never getting those back. And they would be, first of all, designated for this. Uh, I go a step further, Stephanie. Let's, let's assume for a moment that the amount of compensation exceeds those funds. And okay. it may, and it may. because and something it may. like 500 it, billion. It, it, well, what's a life worth? When yeah, you're torturing somebody and all that. This uh, reminds me of the um, 60 Minutes I saw years ago of the gentleman. I wish I could remember his name. It was his responsibility to determine the compensation uh, to the 9-11 victims. And uh, it was an interesting matrix of considerations. And um, I mean, it was just fascinating on how do you calculate the worth, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, the value of a life well, and the impact part of the family and Part of that is, does it shock your conscience, you know? Um, beyond 9-11, which was awful, terrible, horrible, um, you, you, have, you have now people are being shot in the eye, people being dumped oh, into ah. pits, a la Germany in the 30s. Uh, so, I, you know, um, I think it may exceed the amount of money that's being held. And if that's the, if that's the case, assume that with me for a moment. Okay, that means that in our lifetimes, and for years and years to come, nobody can excuse those claims. Not NATO, not the EU, not the US. Those claims are going to stay with Russia. They're going to be on Russia's back forever. Russia is going to have to pay them either by assets that are already frozen or by any business that Russia wants to do with the West. They're all going to be subject to those claims. This is a, this is a train wreck. Whatever else happens with the with the um, sanctions, whatever sanctions might be rolled back as part of a, a peace agreement, those claims for death and injury are not going away. No. You know, Jay, there's also not just the financial claims, but there's the social moral claims. And I'll, you, I'll look at Germany as an example. I mean, it's really taking two generations for them to try to out, outlive the, the Holocaust that was perpetrated by Germans, um, and there was support by Germans. Mm -hmm. And two generations later, um, finally, they're starting to see the, you know, the light of day about the guilt factor and, and the way they're being viewed by the rest of the world. So uh, you're right, it's, there's a price to pay, but it's not just financial. I well, I think the article that we all have um, by Ann Applebaum, it's in the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic.com, and it's from 331. Um, 2022, and and she goes over the past 30 years and all of of the inattention that the West has given to these emerging and uh, pre war preparing them pre preparatory countries, and we've let that go. And the only thing that is going to allow freedom and liberal values to exist on this planet is if we are ferocious as are the ukraines who who are ferocious it's a ferocity of their response is what is a model for how all the rest of the west must resist these what she calls neo imperialist appetites and that these there are several a group of countries you know them well who are um, absolutely coveting the uh, all the territory that's nearby them, and uh, we can run those off, you know, easily on our fingers. So if uh, that this is a very serious and not a theoretical war, and that it has, we have to ramp up all of the ways that we can install the protections for um, the free world and for liberal values. And those include things that we haven't done while we've done a lot of stuff. We haven't done things like have a Russian um, television or radio program that uh, gives us access to the people. But I'm sure that Tim, you can think of other things that we haven't done and need to do in order to protect um, the, the West's um, Well, I'll go to someone that was our former president, which I did not admire or support, but I respected him. And that was President Ronald Reagan. He knew the nature of Russia and the government of Russia. And he never for one moment let his guard down. Um, we haven't had a president like Ronald Reagan that had that kind of um, understanding about the nature of, of the Russian government and, and their intentions. And we're back to those days. And 
I'm glad to see that, you know, our, the lights have come on and our awareness is starting to pick up because uh, we've been very naive about Putin and his, his ways. And it's time to understand where Putin is and where he's coming from and the nature of Putin and what he's going to do. So um, I'm not saying we're back to the, a, a Ronald Reagan type of approach to Russia, but at least we're, our awareness, our situation awareness is far, far better than it was um, a year ago. Well, certainly, yes, we've been jerked. Yeah, we've been jerked. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're uh, out of time. So um, let's uh, have last comments. Um, Jay, would you um, uh, give us your last comment and before we go to Tim? Well, and then... let's not get too um, let's not get too comfortable about um, you know solidarity. The solidarity we've seen in Europe, uh, which is pretty good now, especially uh, in the shadow of Buka. Um, could 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 disappear. The dilemma you talk about, Stephanie, um, the dilemma is: uh, should I continue the solidarity or, or or get back to normal and buy my gas and not worry about what's going on in Ukraine? So um, I think there's a, there's a substantial risk that it'll reverse in terms of public opinion and governmental action uh, in Europe. Um, but whatever happens in Europe, that'll be it'll be much more. Um, much more in favor of solidarity than in the U.S., because I think uh, that the U.S. has a dysfunctional government. Congress is dysfunctional. The Senate especially is dysfunctional. They don't care about this. They don't understand that Ukraine is, as the foreign minister said yesterday, Ukraine doesn't mind, but Ukraine is fighting the war for all of us, for the West, for the liberal order. Uh, and and it is extremely important to everybody on the planet. Um, but I think in the U.S. we um, we have a problem. And uh, come November, um, if uh, the Republicans take over as they will, uh, they'll back out of the whole thing, uh, and Europe will lose the you know support of the United States, uh, and uh, Biden will be hampered in his efforts to support the Ukrainians. It's not a good picture. Uh, every time the Republicans undermine the president, um, that in turn undermines the solidarity in Europe. So let's let's see what happens. But uh, I don't think you can make any guarantees on any of that. Yeah. So, Tim, can you give us a final comment on this this time? Sure. And yeah, I, this conversation has been great and it's brought up a lot of things in my mind. You know, President Putin right now, believe it or not, enjoys an 80 percent support from the Russian people. What does this teach us? This teaches us the value and the effectiveness of what a propagandist can do. And we are not exempt from this. Uh, we had, Jay mentioned earlier, the Trump base. Uh, well, through his propaganda, the Trump base went from a 33% to a whopping 49, 50% uh, at time of election in 2020. So it can happen to us, it has happened to us. And if we learn anything is the value of what a propagandist looks like, what kind of propaganda techniques they use, and how do I guard ourselves in the future from would-be propagandists, be it from Putin using our media, using our social media, or from our own politicians using propaganda to further um, uh, conservative political agendas. And unfortunately, right now, when you listen to Fox, I don't know if I'm listening to um, Russian state TV sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so propaganda is the thing to put our guard against, and we must all be aware of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are out of time, and uh, this is uh, Politics for the People, a weekly show. And I'm your host, uh, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Uh, we appreciate your viewership and look forward to having you join us again next week, same time. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.